Welcome to On Scene First with Tracy Eldridge, powered by Rapid SOS. As a trusted public safety data partner and creators of the world's first emergency response data platform, Rapid SOS is sharing critical data with 911 to help first responders like myself get the information we need to save lives and property. To learn how you can become Rapid SOS ready and better protect the ones you love, visit rapidsos.com today. Now on with the show. I'm your host, Tracy Eldridge. I am wicked excited to highlight the latest and greatest must-have technology tools and mental health resources for public safety. With 24 years in public safety, I am truly honored to bring you entertaining, educational, and empowering conversations with public safety difference makers who are harnessing the power of new technology out of the box thinking and mental health support services to save lives on both sides of the call. Hey friends, welcome to episode eight. I am wicked excited to have my good friend and colleague, Mark Fletcher here with us today. Uh, Mark is is one of those voices in 911 that when you hear it, you listen up because he's gonna have something well, most of the time, he's going to have something really important to say about 911. Mark Fletcher is the Vice President of Public Safety at 911 Inform LLC. And with almost 40 years in the 911 space in public safety, starting as a police dispatcher, a special officer, the chief architect of public safety solutions at Nortel and Avaya, Mark brings a vast knowledge of all things 911. And today I'm excited to be talking about the recently enacted law, Carrie's Law, as well as the Ray Bombs Act. And we're also going to talk about what three words. We know lots of folks are wondering what this what three words thing is. So we're going to touch base on that. So I, Mark, I am so happy to have you here with me, friend. Um, why don't you kind of introduce yourself, let us know what you're doing these days, and let's get this party started. Sure, no problem. So thanks for having me on your podcast. I'm so happy that you got this kicked off, and it's wonderful what you're doing out there. Thank you. Um, did I say that right? That I was, think you that did, was yeah. Wrote, yep, that's that was how exactly you wrote how it. I wrote it, yep. Okay. <laughs> so, so I moved on from Avaya. I'm vice president of public safety at a new company called 911 Inform, where we're doing 911 location discovery in the enterprise and a couple other really, really cool things. And one of the things I started with my podcasts, I was thinking about all the great people that I know that are out there and how they're really making the future of next generation 911, but also creating the next generation of <laughs> 911 experts. So I came up with a new podcast series called Next Gen 911 Future Makers. And I've had some incredibly great people on there. Like, um, <laughs> and you to round it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were my second pick. But I've had Jeremy <laughs> DeMar on there. I've had you because I had to. Had no choice. Uh, had no choice. Uh, and coming up on the next one, I've got you know, 911 flunkies that are out there, like <laughs> Karina Holmes and <laughs> folks of the FCC, you know, a bunch of nobodies. So yeah, right. you know, I figured I know all these people. Let me get them on a podcast and talk about the technology a little bit, but I'm really focusing on what they're doing to build the next generation of leaders. And it's really interesting, the things that people are doing that are out there. And I think, so, so I just want to go back to the call when you called me to tell me about this podcast and you're like, I got this idea for a podcast and, <laughs> and it's called NG911 Future Makers. And I'm like, dude, next generation <laughs> is here. Like it's not in the future, it's here. And it took you a little while to actually explain to me that it wasn't about the actual technology piece of the next generation I want. It was about building this next generation of folks that are going to be passionate and, you know, the importance of leadership building that next generation of. So I'll be honest with you. I knew what it makers. was about. <laughs> I knew what it was about, but I didn't know how to vocalize it until I talked to you. Well, and you I'm like, no oh, no, it's the next generation. You I had to explain right there. it to someone who couldn't figure it out. So in your head, you knew what it looked like. But 
Really? You, man, you mansplained it to me. <laughs> I don't know how I did that because, you know, I'm a girl. I know. I you know girl explained it. Okay. <laughs> girl explained it. Um, no, I think that's, I think that's awesome. And, you know, I love that you got back into doing the podcast things. I actually met you through your podcast. The, the first time I had heard your voice or heard who you were, because I was one of those folks in the center that was constantly you know, trying to keep up on things and learn new things. And, and yeah, I'll admit, I listened to your podcast and, and I remember the first time that we met and, and we've briefly talked about this, but I, th I think it's, you know, always a funny story for folks that may not have heard it. Um, about four years ago, four and a half years ago, I think at this time, I was presenting at the national Nina conference and you were in the audience and I had no idea you were in the audience and I had put up a slide on Carrie's law. Now we're going to talk a little bit about Carrie's law because you, you know, had a very significant hand in, in making that happen. But I had put the Carrie's, Carrie's law slide in there because I had an incident with some stuff that happened in my jurisdiction and it, I stumbled upon Carrie's law and I thought to myself, like, this is a topic that 911 telecommunicators need to really know about. And if you think back four and a half years ago, nobody was really talking about it in the 911 space. So tell me about the reaction you had when you see this random girl from Massachusetts who talks funny, adds ours where they don't belong, takes them away where they do, and obviously says wicked a lot. What did you think when I pop up this slide and I'm about to talk about something that was so very near and dear to your heart and that you had been working so hard on? Well, first of all, the guy that drug me into that particular <laughs> session was Michael Martin. And I think Nick was there as well. And he said, come on, we're going in here. Uh, you know, sit down with us. So the three of us are sitting there and I'm watching this woman from mass just go on and on and on about relatively good stuff and she's a decent presenter and then the carries slide law slide then the carries law slide pops up and i said oh this should be interesting and then you got your red pen out right yeah and yeah immediately to... <laughs> immediately sure because trust me i mean every and i appreciate everybody who tried and brought it, but usually people get a lot of stuff wrong. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, let me see what, what she's going to get wrong. And you, you gave this great explanation and you had, I don't know, there were maybe one or two things that weren't wrong, but I would have said differently. Yeah. And I really had nothing to critique you on. I really had a nitpick. <laughs> and, and that was hard for you. Yeah, that was. So I figure, okay, I got to knock her off her pedestal here because that's just who I am. So I stood up to ask a question, and when I asked my question, your jaw hit the floor. <laughs> well, because I heard your voice, and I'm like, I think that's Mark Fletcher. I'm like, I think that's Fletch. And then you came up to me after the presentation, and yes. you, know, you, you shook my and, – and actually, what I saw before you, had, before you spoke to me um, and the, the slide went up, I – I saw you kind of perk up and you took a picture of the slide. Yeah, I did. And I'm like, uh oh, like, what, what, like, am I not supposed to be talking about this? Like, of course, my spaz brain started, like, like, all these thoughts keep going through my head. And I'm like, this is the first time I'm speaking at the national level for Nina. And like, who's this guy? And, um, and then you told me after that you had sent a text message of the slide, a picture to, to Carrie's dad, uh, Hank Hunt. And, and that, from that moment on, you had introduced Hank and I, and and now we're we're all family and uh, a functionally dysfunctional family. I will. Oh yeah. I will definitely add there, but being able to watch because four and a half years ago. So let's let's talk a little bit uh, because Carrie's law is there. Like like we did this right. We 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 made it happen. But I still think that folks in the nine one space are a little confused on how it affects them or what they can do so why don't we start to peel back the layers of the onion how did you get involved here how did a guy from new jersey run into a guy with a 10 gallon 10 gallon hat in, in texas so you know i'd been working on mlts problems 
for a decade. And, you know, even when I was a telephone technician, I realized that, hey, there's a problem. People need to be able to dial 911. And there are things you can do in the phone system called dial plan that easily fix that to allow it to happen. It's just a little bit of basic software programming. And it was something that I always had a passion for because I was a dispatcher and I was a first responder from years past. And this was really important to me. Um, when I got my job at Nortel and Avaya, I would set up a Google alert looking for 911, next gen 911 issues that would come out. And one day I got on my Google alerts this petition from this guy in Texas that was, had lost his daughter. And when I read the story of how it happened, I said, oh my God. This was because 911 couldn't be dialed directly. And Mike, can you just touch base a little bit on that story for folks that are just just getting into dispatch that may not have heard just kind of the gist? Because Hank will join me on a podcast in, in the foreseeable future. Um, but just for those that are listening now, can you just give a little bit about, you know, what happened with Carrie's story and how we got here? Sure. When you have Hank on the podcast, remember, little words, single <laughs> syllables. You can tell him I said that. I'm telling. <laughs> He's like a brother to me now. I know, I know. So it's kind of, it's really a tragic story, but back on December 1st, 2013, um, really just seven years ago, yeah. from a couple of weeks ago, um, Carrie had separated her from her husband. She took her three children to a hotel in Marshall, Texas to meet with him for visitation for the weekend. She was going to leave the kids with him. Um, he pulled her into the bathroom to discuss things or whatever and ended up stabbing her 29 times. So while she's being stabbed over and over and over and over again, she's screaming. Her nine-year-old daughter, her eldest, Brianna, um, obviously knew something was wrong. Mom is screaming. She runs over to the hotel room phone and does what she's been taught to do her entire life. Yep. Dial 911. Now, that hotel did not have the programming in place, and you had to dial 9911. Which is something no. that people just don't, you don't think about. You don't think about teaching your kids, hey, oh, if you're in a building that has a lot of phones, you have to dial 9 before that. And you know what? I Wouldn't mean, know. Who, who's supposed to do a technical analysis Right on, on people's phone systems. I wouldn't even know. I I don't even think that would have clicked for me as an adult that works in 911. So there were people that were in the World Trade Center on 9-11 and that worked in the Office of Emergency Management. And they dialed 911 directly when they knew they had to dial 911. Right. People don't think about it in an emergency, you react. We all know this. Mm -hmm. and that's exactly, you know, and again, there are phone systems where you have to dial eight or a seven or this or that. And hotels are particularly problematic because many hotels said, call the front desk. Right, right. Dial this number for 911, which does who knows what. So I had been blogging about that the whole year and sure enough, this problem happens. I read it in my Google alerts, and I'm like, oh, my God, this person died because they couldn't dial 911 direct. And I had just written a blog about a week earlier, and I was really getting, I was getting a little pissed because the problem was being ignored by the industry in, and everyone in general. And I was like... Somebody is going to die if something doesn't change here. And sadly, that happens all too often is you have some folks that are passionate, passionate, and they bring this up and, and it, and it, you know, it doesn't get to the places that it needs to get to. And, and that's sad. So fast forward, um, I know Hank is going to talk about his change.org and how that got there, but Let's talk about where you got involved. So you reach out to Hank because of this change.org, because of them driving this mission and go from there. 
So I re- it, was, it was the hardest phone call I ever made in my entire life, Tracy. I, I'm I sure. reached out and I, I got a hold of him through social media and his Facebook page. And I said, hi, this is who I am. Uh, I can help you with your project here, your, your petition. Um, I'd like to help. You know, can, I, can we have a conversation? And he goes, yeah, okay, here's my number, call me. And I, I swear to God, I dialed the number halfway three times. And I hung up. Because what like, do you say, oh, right? Like, what, how what, do you what, start what, off this conversation? Hey, hi, uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, how do you start the conversation? So I finally call, he answers. And and now we're having this conversation. And he's like, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> and I hear in his head, what's, what's, what's playing in this proud Texan's head is, goddamn Yankee, where is he looking to make a book? Uh, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and I'm like, you know, listen. I'm not looking to make a dollar. There's not a dollar for me to make off of this. I right. want to fix this problem. And if you're willing, I will get you in front of the people that need to hear this. I've got connections and I can get you where you need to be. But this is your story. And I think this is what convinced him. I said, this is your story and you need to tell it. Yep. This moved very quickly, right? I mean, you know, when I think about back when I was a kid watching how a bill becomes a law, like the little dude on the I'm just a bill. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) So I think about that of like there's all these steps in in it and at we're here where where there's a law named after her. But when it went through the process, it seemed like every coin toss was won there. Do you do you feel that way or yeah, and it was, and, and there's a reason for that. Um, I'd been working on MLTS legislation for a decade, trying to get the model legislation and trying to get states to adopt and, God forbid, a federal law about 911 for MLTS. And it was really just going nowhere. There was no driver for that. And what was really stalling the 911 is that bill was trying to be everything. It was trying to solve the location problem with 911, which is a problem for no matter where you are, whether it's cellular, MLTS, whatever. Location is always a problem because it's 911, where's your emergency, right? Need to know where you are to do anything. So with Kerry's law, it wasn't about location. It was about access. And I decided from the very beginning that Kerry's law was going to be about access and nothing more. And if it's simple, people would understand that. Right. You explain Kerry's law to anybody. Oh, yeah, the, the nine thing. Yeah. Oh, I would never think about that. Yep. Right. That's right. And then the other part of the problem that's easily solved, police car, fire truck showing up out front. What are you guys doing here? Somebody called 911. They did? Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So on-site notification. And when I looked at those two problems, I said to myself, I can fix both without spending a nickel on anything. And I did a survey of all the competitive phone system manufacturers, and they could also solve that problem without spending a nickel. Now, we didn't solve the location problem. Right. But... We enabled access, and I enabled notification. And if you knew what phone dialed it, people could get you to the right location. And I said, if I can get that passed, I'll guarantee you that the other will follow very quickly as an add-on. Gee, what happened? The Ray Bombs Act, three weeks after Kerry's law was signed. So, so let's let's just go back to the Kerry's law and. And point out again, for those that were kind of listening to the story, the components of the actual carries law. Two components. Okay. Direct access yep. to 911 without dialing an access code from every phone on the system. Okay. On-site notification, letting somebody in the building or within the network, someone within the realm of responsibility know that 
that station dialed 911. That's so, it. So I'll share a little bit about the story, how I stumbled up upon Carrie's Law. And, you know, the reason why I put it in there, because at the time, if, if, you, if you just said, okay, well, if it's about access and accessibility when they get there, what does that have to do with 911? What can 911 do? And I want to share and it, just one example, and there's so many, but just one example of how you can make a difference. So one of the things that burns my butt when I when I work in 9-1 centers or do training and consulting, um, I in one of the classes that I do for Tony Harrison and the public safety group, I, I, I do an overview of discrepancy forms. And when I put the little paper version up there just to kind of show the, the fields that folks should be aware of, um, I do so after I have reviewed the alley screen uh, because you'd be surprised at how many people just don't utilize the information that is is on the alley screen to begin with, right? Yep. So there's folks out there that don't understand confidence and uncertainty and how that's relevant. So in this particular class, back to basics, you know, talking about the all the components of the the alley screen but then the importance of the alley discrepancy form and in this particular case uh, my dispatcher had taken a 911 call a, a transfer it had transferred from new bedford so we're in rochester new bedford is about 20 minutes away my dispatcher says where is the fire and they gave the description of this facility up on cranberry highway and it was for a fire so she dispatches the fire department. And as I walked by the screen, I see the name of the company that's on Route 28, but it's in New Bedford. And I said to her, I said, did New Bedford transfer that call? And she said, yes. And I said, okay, well, we need to figure out why. And she goes, well, I guess it went to them by accident. And I'm like, mm, I don't think so. I think, yeah. I, think it went, I think it went intentionally there and it shouldn't have. Yeah. So, Things don't, nothing happens by accident. Right. Computers do what they're told to do. That always cracks me up. Exactly. So, so for me, because I was so adamant about knowing every detail on how the system works, I'm not going to let this one go. So my husband's a captain on the fire department. He's got command of the scene. They get the fire knocked down. I ask him to call me. So he calls me and I said, can you find out who called 911 and have her call me on the business line? So she calls me and I said, did you call 911 from that facility? And she said, yes. Now in my mind, maybe like I could have gone through the scenarios, like maybe she used her cell phone and called the main facility, right? And then the main facility calls and says, hey, mm -hmm. you have a fire and then it gets transferred. But we have to know, right? You can't, this is where that 911 piece comes in. If a call comes to you, and it's hooky, it like it doesn't make sense. Like, why did that call get transferred? Um, you have to like, yes, hooky. Yes, that's a technical term. You didn't know that? <laughs> no, I didn't. I'm <laughs> so, writing that one down though. Hooky. That's if a it's good hooky, one. <laughs> that's the definition of a discrepancy form. If it's hooky. So um I asked her, I said, Did you call from the facility or did you call somebody at the main facility? And she said, No, I called from our our scale house here on the property. And I said, okay, well, there's a problem and we need to get it fixed. So I filled out the discrepancy form because that's what you're supposed to do. And yep. a lot of people don't realize that when an MLTS call comes into you from somewhere else where it doesn't belong, if that call gets to you and it wasn't supposed to, you have to fill out a discrepancy form. So that's my first message to the 91 folks. So I contacted, I filled out the discrepancy form and I contacted the main facility. And I said, you have a problem. Your phone's on site, deliver the call to New Bedford and we have to get that changed. Okay, okay. I said, no, seriously, like this is a, this is a construction type facility. It's, you know, industrial, like you could have bad things happen. We, we really need to get this taken care of. Okay, okay. Six months later, we get another call and it was for a, 50 year old male who fell about 40 feet off a of scaffolding and was impaled with a piece of rebar. Oh, nice. The 911 call went to New Bedford and then came to us. So nothing was done. And even though I filled out the discrepancy form, I did what I was supposed to do, the company didn't. So that's where I actually stumbled upon Carrie's Law because I wanted to know what are the recourses when you don't do 911 the way you're supposed to. Mm hmm. 
So when folks ask, how does this affect 911? Number one, you should be filling out discrepancy forms when you're supposed to. And if you don't know when you're supposed to, go back and review, right? And number two, no matter where I go in the country, no matter what place I go to, I'm always looking at the phones. And when I look at the phone, I'm going to say, Does, do I have to dial nine to get an outside line? And think about all the people over the last couple of years that are tagging you and tagging Hank Hunt and, and these folks in these posts showing like, hey, they're, they're compliant, they're not compliant. So those are two things that I think are, are really important for us to do that. So tell us about, um, tell us your version of when President Trump was about to sign that. Like we get through all of the processes that we need to, and it was kind of a big deal of a day. Talk a little bit about that when it got signed. So it was February 14th of 2018 and um it was a pretty busy week and i get a phone call from hank on wednesday night hey what are you doing <laughs> nothing he goes what are you doing friday it's friday's friday whatever i said why he goes because you and i are going down to washington because the president is going to sign Kerry's law crazy and i'm like are you kidding me he goes no so Kerry's birthday was the ninth, just the week before, and that's when it passed out of Congress. And what I forgot from I'm just a bill <laughs> was that it has 10 days for the president to sign it. And if he doesn't, it's an automatic veto and you go back to square one. Ugh. Had I known that, I would have been freaking out. Right. Well, Good geez. thing you didn't, though, right? Good thing I didn't, right? Because four and a half years, which took a long time, but it was quick. Everybody right. said it's going to be a decade to get this done. But we got it done quick. So exciting. We go down there and we, you know, to get into the White House is not an easy thing. Well, I would hope not. You go through a lot of security <laughs> checks. And uh, I met Brianna for the very first time that day um, in uh, Congressman Gohmert's office. And uh, we all go over to the White House and we're, we're walking through. We go through the security checks and we open this one door and walk in. And we're in the Oval Office. Wow. Like, oh, my God, we're in the Oval Office. So we're all standing around the desk. We're waiting for the president to come in. And uh, Hank leans over to me and he goes, uh, hey, there's bird crap on the window. <laughs> we should get that cleaned up. I'm like, okay, whatever. I can and we totally turn. see him saying it, too. Serious. And then we turn attack. around and there's Trump. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I remember I, when he got the news that he was going and he sent me a text message that he was going, I couldn't, I cried. Like I was, I was so happy for this father and family and you, like it was, I, I didn't know if I was coming or going, like I was so excited. And then it clicked, it clicked what day it was. It was the anniversary, the 50th anniversary. Yeah. Of the first 911 call. Wicked. So I awesome. got to tell you, there's, there's, so I'm going to give you an exclusive because <laughs> I don't, I don't tell this part of the story a lot. Should I get the bleep button ready or are we good? No, we're good there. Okay, good. So I turn around and there's the president standing in front of me with his hand out. So I'm shaking his hand and he says to me, is this going to cost businesses a lot of money now you know i can be a little controversial no not you <laughs> you know i can be a little sassy and no, smart ass no my response to him was only hotels sir <laughs> and everybody took a deep breath Oh my God! Did he just say that? Unbelievable! So you and know what he's, he's thinking he, in his mind? How much is this going to cost me so, and all so my you know hotels? What he says to, so you know what he says to me? That's pretty funny. Awesome. Like, of course it is. It's not going to cost anybody a lot of money at all. Great, great law. We need this. Yeah, and, and I, then so he moved I, on, and and everybody breathes a sigh of relief, like, oh my God. Well, it's got to be intimidating to be there too. And whether you like them or not, I don't care at this point. 
you know, it, it's not about that. It's about he signed a law that should have been in fact a long time ago. And when I teach that presentation, um, one of the, the one of the last slides I have in that section is the moral of the story is that ignorance is fixable. And I think a lot of people don't even realize, even 9-1 centers, I remember um, John Adams was our phone guys at Adams Communications. And if, if I had him on the phone right now, he would, he would uh, recall me putting in my new phone system. And I was like, I am not putting in a voice over internet phone, like no VoIP, like there's too much, there's problems, you can't call 911, like all of it. Like I wanted nothing to do with a VoIP phone in my dispatch center. And then he started showing me, yeah, but you can have like 2000 speed dials. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so as we went through this process, we put the phone system in and then I start getting involved in learning about Carrie's law and all this stuff. And I called him and I'm like, John, I just did a test call from my phone and I have to dial a nine. Like it, I, we were in the police station and I didn't even know. Yep. And he was like, Oh, hold on. And he went into the computer and he flicked a switch and that was yep. it. That was it. That's all it took. That's and all it takes. Yeah. And that and is literally in two seconds. I did my research before I brought this to the FCC and pie. And I told him, I said, listen, Everybody can pretty much do this. There isn't a phone system that's out there that was sold in the last five or six years that has a problem with this. I said, I got systems that are 20 years old that can fix this. And the biggest, one of the coolest things, when I was at the FCC talking to Pi about this, he says, oh, geez, I wonder if I can dial 911 from this phone. <laughs> and he can't. Scared. <laughs> And Commissioner O'Reilly actually wrote a blog about it, and that caused a little riff in the FCC. But you know what? They had it fixed right. with a phone call. Yeah, and I think, and and again, when you when you say to folk, when folks in the nine one space are like, okay, what does this have to do with us? How many of you are sitting at a carnival or you know national night out, and you have your booth in nine one one? Do you have information on Carrie's law there? Because yep. It's about educating the public, right? It's your responsibility to make 911 accessible to folks and get them to understand the importance of your places doing it right. And then when I started learning about Carrie's Law, I started reaching out to all of the facilities in our jurisdiction and saying, hey, are you able to dial 911? And if I remember correctly, our phone at the police department, John had set it up that you can either dial nine nine one one or nine one one because just as folks, you know, don't think to dial a nine, some folks might out of habit dial absolutely that nine. So that's helpful. And then let's move on into so a lot of times um, folks will ask me and and I I generalize it, but they'll say, all right, but what is this Raid Bombs Act that's kind of attached to Carrie's law? And what does that mean? Where did that, where did that piece, because at first you were talking about how originally they wanted Carrie's law to encompass everything, which we knew it couldn't, but how did Ray's, Ray Bombs Act come about and what does that mean for us? So Ray Bombs Act requires a dispatchable location to be provided to the on-site person and to the PSAP. And um, every law has a political story behind it. Yep. Won't go into that one because we need two hours. Okay. What dispatchable location is defined as is the street address of the building plus additional information required to locate the individual in a reasonable amount of time. And that's the actual definition. And the reason that's important is because some buildings you walk in the front door and it's small enough where I can find somebody. Or I walk in a building and there's a security guard there who knows exactly where I need to go because he's got the on-site notification. 
It's not about saying, help, I'm at cube 2C231. Where the hell is that? Right, right. Yeah, because that, that means not. It's like that zone means four nothing. when the alarm company calls, right? Exactly. Oh, zone seven's going off. Who cares? Okay, what's that? I don't know what that is. <laughs> you know, is that the hazmat storage or the, or the men's bathroom? Yeah. Which also is a hazmat the same. storage. I was going to say, they, aren't they one and the same? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm bump. Anyway. <laughs> But again, you know, this is this is where I said, look, it's got to be actionable information. And, you know, the the Ray Bombs Act was designed to increase the location accuracy. So I made sure the language was in the definition that made that not an impediment to deploy. Because tracking location is now something that the enterprise MLTS operator needs to account for. And it can be easy, but it can also be very difficult. But there are also internal controls in place where you already are doing that. You just don't realize it. But again, it's not about giving the dispatcher the exact location. They don't need it. They're not showing up. It's about providing the first responders right. with the location when they arrive because that's what they need. And then, so, in your new big boy job at 911 Inform, tell us, tell me a little bit about how, because obviously all of these things are tying in. Like you, you are, you are destined to be at this place with the, the building's capability of assisting 911. How does 911 Inform play into these these laws? So I had worked on. Um, Next generation 911 additional data from the enterprise from an, a one way outbound flow to increase the visible situational awareness for peace apps. Yeah. What 911 Inform did is they took that another step further and they actually, using the architecture from Rapid SOS and that over the top data connection, they made that a two way path. Wow. So I can extend information out to the PSAP, but I can also enable a view back into the enterprise if the enterprise would allow that. Now I've got an IP connection. I can put whatever data I want two-way. Right. So if I want to send live dynamic floor plans, I can do that. If I want to send real-time information like video, I can do that. If I want to enable access control into a connected building, I can do that. So now, active shooter solution situation in a school, anybody in the public safety network, because the dispatcher doesn't really need it, it's whoever the commanding officer is on scene, yep. the first responders, live video, access to door lock controls. I can put that on any connected device whether it's a smartphone a tablet the mdt in the police car and i think so I, I i of course i'm gonna focus on the dispatcher for a second but i'm so glad that you said that it, it can be out in the field and that the telecommunicator isn't the one that's having to make these decisions because i think what happens is they'll read something online or they'll see a headline and it's like oh you know system can lock doors from the 911 center and it's like whoa wait a minute I don't want that responsibility. And I think we really need to get better at it. Cause I, I'll tell you, I was very closed off with the, uh, you know, with rapid SOS wanting to solve the location issue with an app because I was closed minded about it. Oh yeah. I, I wasn't thinking outside the box, but now obviously I've learned that like, well, wait a minute, I'm going to hear this out. And with that te technology capability with the 911 informed stuff, I think it's, it's really important to, to know, say, Hey, yeah, the telecommunicator can take what they need from this situation, but the folks in the field that are running the scenario and, and, and making those big decisions that are not policy and procedure based, they're the ones that are going to have the access to do that. Yep. No, I, I, and, and on my, on my current NG diamond one future makers, Dot com podcast <laughs> where I interviewed Michael Martin of, of rapid SOS. And we talked about the evolution of Haven, 
yeah. the app that you and I and everybody else said, stop, don't do that. But Haven was a great test bed and Haven allowed everyone to understand there's data here that we need to get to the first responder. It, it was that it was the epitome of the proof of concept. Like, hey, yeah. seriously, look, we can do this. And one of the things with that Haven app, and I just I laugh when, you know, Michael told me that he was there to offer me a job. And I and I blatantly told him, I'm like, I'm not I'm not selling anything to public safety and I'm not promoting your stupid app. And I said it to him just like that. And he said, good, <laughs> because we're going to give this product to them for free. And we're going to get Apple and Google to put it in the device. And one of the yep. things that I loved about Haven, which I guess I can admit now, but one of the things that I really loved about Haven was you got to pick and choose what the incident type was. Do you need police? Do you need fire? Yep. Do you need EMS? Is it a car crash? And and I, I think I loved that. I was afraid of it, but I loved it in a sense that if if that person can't communicate with me, at least I know who to send at minimum. Right. So let me let me let me give you this pr simple scenario of why we in the enterprise can increase that level of awareness. Your dispatcher, you're back in dispatcher, Tracy. You answer the phone and you say, where is your emergency? You hear click. And, and you what I street. shouldn't be doing it is saying, damn it, on a recorded line. But yeah, go ahead. <laughs> OK, so you get that. And you got a street address. What do you do? You don't know what to do. But now, either with that event or as a secondary event coming in, you get that street address, temperature sensor 71 in this part of the building, and a floor plan is reading 180 degrees. Yep. What do you think that hang-up call probably was? Fire, fire, fire. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think so when I go back to this new endeavor of mine and getting folks um, one actually an, another new class that that I have in the works um, is is really about it's it's called renovation time, um, you know, time to rebuild your foundation. And part of that, the beginning of that session is getting folks to go back to when they were a baby dispatcher. Like, no, it's not some weird, creepy. Imagine yourself being born type class, but Remember who you were when you were first a dispatcher and how passionate you were and how eager you were to do it right and to get any and all information that you could help somebody and, and you were so excited and then now look where you might be. What? All right. Yep. We'll send them out. Click. Right. So I want folks to get that passion again and this technology actually has the ability to help us reignite that spark if you will no pun intended to say you know when i if i asked nine out of ten dispatchers why they do what they do or why they started doing what they do, they're doing it's to help people i'm i'm really excited to see a lot of this technology come to fruition and what gets me more excited is being able to explain it to folks in a way that it's not so scary right so if you walked into a dispatch center and said hey we have a way in an active shooter situation for you to shut and lock all the doors and like it, the dispatcher is going to be like, uh, no, that is not in my pay grade. Yep. Oh, wait a minute. There is an ability. It's not your responsibility, but what you are going to get is this, this, and this, right? Yep. So, all right. So we've covered Carrie's law, which I wanted to cover. We covered rape bombs act. Can you also talk a little bit about this, what three words thing. So I saw your blog that went out and if you guys hadn't seen it, you can check it out through Mark's information, which we'll make sure is, is linked in, in the notes. Um, but the big buzz right now is what three words. There's a lot of folks out there wanting to know what three words is, how it's going to help them. Why are we doing it? And I know you've done some, some work speaking to them recently. So can you give us kind of an overview of what what three words is? So what three words is taking some basic technology and it's very much misunderstood. It is not a location detection or determination technology. It does not find people. Okay. What it does is it provides a very simple three word shorthand, if you will, that will represent every 
th one meter square on the planet. Okay. So they've mapped the planet down to one meter squares, three feet by three feet. And they've used this algorithm of three words to represent each one of those squares. And there's billions of them. And there, these words are like toaster, pen, paper. Not paper, paper, right. No. Toaster, pen, paper. And they've got no meaning and no reference to anybody, but they're easily communicable between two humans. Okay. And the way that it's written is slash, slash, slash. Okay. Word, dot, word, dot, word. And you're now seeing applications recognize that as a what three words address. And the what three words application basically is the Captain Crunch secret decoder ring. Okay. It takes those three words and decodes them into a lat lawn. Or it'll take a lat long and encode that into three words. It'll take a street address, geocode the street address, convert it in or out, whatever way you want it. So it's just a big Captain Crunch decoder ring. So, so after having a conversation with some folks as we were talking through this, um, why? I, I think why is the big question is, I'm hoping to have um, some folks from What Three Words on the podcast in the near future too, um, to definitely talk about this because it is beneficial, it is helpful, but they need to know why. So, so I know Jeremy DeMar, you mentioned Jeremy has recently put this in his center. So when he jumps on, he's going to be explaining, you know, more about why they did it. But what is a telecommunicator? How does it help me to have this system in my center? Who's going to give them those three words? Where are those three words going to come from? Is right. the caller going to be responsible for giving them those three words? Is it going to appear somewhere? Talk me through how they're going to see it and, and what's the benefit of having the access to the, to the decoder ring, if you will. So good questions. And the answer is all of the above. Okay. So for example, um, the easiest way or the, the, a good example, I think for dispatch, where are you? I have no idea. I'm out someplace around here. Okay. Um, I see that you're on a cell phone. You yep. know that. Yep. Can I send you a link on your cell phone? And when you get that link, I just want you to click it. Okay. So they get the link. They click on the link. It brings them to a What Three Words web page that says your location is complete.radical.preset. Great. The dispatcher can say to the person, what three words are you getting back on the link? I'm getting com compete.radical.preset. The dispatcher puts that information into their what three words interface and gets an exact map location of where your cell phone thinks it is down to one meter square. Okay. Now the cool part about that is my house has a street address. Great. The middle of the field that's behind me doesn't have a street address. Right. The middle of a lake doesn't have a street address. I can be out in the middle of the ocean between here and England and every one of those three foot squares has a three words address. So now it works, when the, so it when works the, anywhere on the planet. So when the link is sent out to me as a caller and I click it, I'm restricted. I have to tell the telecommunicator those three words or does the telecommunicator get to see it on their screen as well? I believe that it just gives you the three words. Okay. It's, it's, and, and here's, here's the thing that drives me freaking batty. We talked about, and we ran into this with Carrie's Law, and we run into this stuff with location and all the time. You know, it's like we come up with a solution for location. Well, what about what the if? guy who's the standing on his left foot, balancing on a basketball, you know, 
and his arm is over the state border. What are you going to yep. do then? Yep. I said, oh, okay, let me add that to the list of never going to happen 911 calls. Yeah. Yeah. Who cares? Yeah. And I, th I think you're I think you're 100 percent right. And and I just asked that question, too. And it's funny that we got here because that is what I want, folks. Again, I, I want people to understand that there's going to be new technology that's coming out. This is new technology. Right. And is it going to work for every single solitary situation? No. But if it works for one where something else or all the other tools did not work, then it is worth its weight in gold. And one of the things that I had explained to someone who had asked, like, but we have rapid SOS. We, we don't need what three words. And I'm like, but what if the caller is on an iPhone 11? They don't have rapid SOS because yeah. there are still folks that are on that type of network, right? Exactly. So, or on that type of operating system. So you're gonna have a handful of people that when you take all of these tools and put them together, and then one of the other things that um, one of the folks had said is, I, I don't want them to have to have another thing that they have to like remember or another you know thing that they 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 can forget actually is like oh when to use this well you know being able to have this tool in the it, to, to me it's all about having tools in the toolbox and training on them and you know, having a monthly training, like, hey, you know, text one of your officers the link, find out where they are, get proficient in it, because there's going to come a time where that caller cannot tell you where they are. And for whatever reason, rapid SOS location isn't there. It's a phase one call. And the only tool you're going to have in your toolbox is this one. Yep. Mark, I love talking to you, unlike most people, but um, I really <laughs> enjoy talking. We to all have you. our faults. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate you and all the work that you've done for 911. I know a lot of times you're kind of behind the scenes and, and you're making a lot of things happen. And I just want to let you know that I truly appreciate what you do for all of us. I appreciate what you've done for me. You have been extremely helpful in my endeavor here. And uh, I'm, I'm glad you were here. So thank you for joining me. I just want to make the world a better place. That was not even convincing at all. Uh, I really love what I do. And you know what? It, it's a great level of satisfaction. So, so, you know, the fact that I'm helping you help others makes me feel great. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I truly appreciate that. The listeners appreciate that. But go back and save the world. And uh, hopefully we'll uh, see you in the near future doing awesome things. Absolutely. Find me at Fletch.tv. And please check out my new podcast, ng911futuremakers.com. Got some great, great stuff with some real interesting thought leaders in the industry. And me. I'm very, very happy. <laughs> and, and Tracy's there <laughs> to balance it because I had to. But, you know. It was your obligation. It was my obligation. I will make sure that the links are available to folks in the show notes. So, yeah, check them Perfect. out. Perfect. He kind of knows what he's talking about. A little bit. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> Thanks, my friend. Have a great day. All right. Day. Take it easy. Thank you for listening. Make sure you join us next time for another episode of entertaining, educational, and empowering interviews with public safety difference makers. Please like and follow my Facebook and LinkedIn pages on Scene First with Tracy Eldridge so you too can keep up with my shenanigans. Thank you, heroes. From the bottom of my blessed heart, stay safe. Stay strong and stay here. We need you. For more information on Rapid SOS and how you can get connected to the world's first emergency response data platform and better prepare and protect your family and communities, visit rapidsos.com and tell them Tracy sent you.